ladies and gentlemen, can we uh, all gather together? Welcome to Holiness and Sanctuary Church this afternoon, particularly <coughs> family and friends of Doris. It's lovely to have you here and we're very grateful to be able to celebrate the life with you in this memorial service. A couple of things, a little bit of housekeeping before we begin, uh, just for the sake of everyone who is not used to being in church, which is often the case when people come to funerals. So a couple of things. Funerals can make us feel all sorts of things. Sometimes we are gripped with grief and mourning. Uh, we may not expect that to be the case, but then something said or a photo comes up and all of a sudden it, that affects us in that way. If for any reason uh, tears come to you, embrace them. That's fine. At other times during a funeral, someone may say something which is highly amusing. Love. It's okay. There's no problem. We will all respond differently to the heightened emotions that we generally feel at times like this. No one in this church is looking at you and expecting you to dress or behave in any particular way. We're just glad you're here to celebrate Dawn's life. So please feel free to be and to react as you see fit. Another human thing, the toilets <laughs> are through the doors and to your right in the back of the hall. And no one is going to worry about when you've got them. They're not going to ask you why. Uh, so please feel free to just do what you need to do. <laughs> and thirdly, and very importantly, if you've got a mobile phone, put it on silent. <laughs> because it is not at all unusual for someone's phone to go off. And that person always feels terrible. I don't want it to be you. And as much as I will rush to your side and pretend it's my phone, I'll be too late. <laughs> so please make sure your phone is at least on vibrate, but definitely uh, when the sounds off, that will be really helpful. Okay. Dora has been part of life in this parish for 40 years or so, maybe a short time. Um, but during the last part of that, our pastoral worker, Ms. Beck, has been visiting her and uh, speaking with her and spending time with her. Anna just happens to be an incredibly gifted flautist. Uh, we know that Dora enjoyed the music of the Bach, or the Bachs. <laughs> and so to begin the service today, Anna will play for us. And uh, I invite you to sit back. Rest into the music, let it sweep over you, and then we will begin.
lives immortal, that you brought life and immortality to life through the gospel. May we, with Dora and all the baptized, know the full light of your risen presence. In the waters of baptism, we died with Christ and began to walk in newness of life. May we, with Dora and all the baptized, be brought to the fulfillment of your eternal kingdom. Life, Dora was nourished by the word of God. May Christ greet us with Dora, saying, Come, bless of my Father. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, you bore our sins on the cross. May this cross be a sign to us of your love for Dora and the forgiveness of her sins. Amen. sheets there are occasional moments where in the bold text you're asked to respond. We understand that there are people who will not wish to say the prayers because they don't see themselves as people of faith. If there's no compulsion if you wish to join in the prayers then please do. If you don't then you're just as welcome to sit there quietly. So grace and peace from the Lord be with you. We have come together to thank God for the life of Dora. To mourn and honour her, and to lay to rest her mortal body, and to support one another in grief, we face the certainty of our own death and judgment. Yet Christians believe that those who die in Christ share eternal life with him. Therefore, in faith and hope, we turn to God, who created and sustains us all. In the Gospel of John, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life, says the Lord. Those who believe in me, even though they die, yet they will live. And in St. Paul's letter to the Romans, there are these comforting words. I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else, in all creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. If you wish to, I invite you to stand for our first hymn, The Lord's My Shepherd, which is essentially Psalm 23. <coughs>
Please be seated. Let us pray. Loving God, that you alone are the source of life, may your life giving spirit flow through us and fill us with compassion and wonder for our In our sorrow, give us the calm and your peace. In our hope, and let our grief give way to joy. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now we come to the most important part of any funeral, the time when the people closest to the deceased <coughs> and share their memories. So Peter, I invite you to come forward and speak. educational systems in 
developing countries, working directly there and by mentoring students from many nations, many of whom went on to hold senior positions in government and academia in their own countries. As her great friend, colleague, and PhD supervisor Peter O'Brien tells us, she was regarded as an excellent administrator by her colleagues and an excellent lecturer and supervisor by her students. Her dear friend Helena Tucker, who Dora also taught at Harrow, remembers, Dora's zest for life resonated with her pupils and her lessons were different from what we'd known, as she considered art, literature, food, and fashion as as worthy of interest as politics, wars, and the lives of the ruling elite. Hers was always a broad, all-encompassing view. There's no doubt that Dora liked being in charge of things, both personally and professionally. Peter O'Brien wrote of supervising her PhD. As a student, I found her willing to take advice and to take constructive comments eventually. <laughs> My first thought when I read that was, she was willing to take advice. <laughs> Looking over her career, you could say that she sought advancement and succeeded in gaining power and was good at exercising it. But the contradiction is that there was never any sense of self-aggrandizement in her work. She exercised her power almost entirely in the service of others. Her own research output was solid but her greatest contribution is measured in the long shelf of 26 master's degrees and PhDs she supervised, the academic program she designed, the generosity with which she gave her time to a host of committees, mostly as a public service outside of the university. As Peter wrote, Dora was one of those people who got things done quietly, without fuss, and without wanting attention. One of those people who, in former days, would have been described as the backbone of the empire, or, in this case, the university. I am honored, he said, to have been her friend for so long. This, I think, hints at one of the great themes of Dora's life, her sense of duty. I'm sure she learned this from her mother, Charlotte, a decorated nurse in the First War who lost her husband, my grandfather, Harry Briggs, to a mining accident just before Dora was born. Dora and Jeff were raised by their mother and by their two unmarried aunts, Elsie and Ellis. When Jeff had left the UK to make a life in New Zealand with Judy, Dora interrupted her university studies to care for her aunts and her mother in their final years, often working her employment around this. I know she felt it was expected of her, and expected it of herself, but she accepted this obligation without complaint and cared for them until they passed. But beyond any family, family obligation, she embraced her duty to her community as part of her job. As principal of UNESA's Wyoming campus, she was a tireless advocate for the town and fought hard, often at professional cost, to change Wyoming from a one industry town by building educational opportunities for its young people, serving on education committees, but also as a member of the Wyoming Industrial Development Executive. I think the powers that be were a bit worried that she'd be too soft for Wyala. But as she used to say, I grew up in East Midlands, I do not fear the Iron Triangle. <laughs> I don't know the exact context, but in her papers, uh, I found a handwritten note from 1996. Dear Jim, she wrote, thank you for your message. I should be honored to have my photograph in the foyer since I left my heart in Wyala. My face may as well join it. She was an active member of this church, volunteering her time in many ways, and a financial supporter of 15 charities. It was a lesson she tried to teach others throughout her life. In the 100th anniversary book of St. Hilda's College in Buenos Aires, published in 2012, she's remembered this way. She was replaced by Miss Dora Briggs in 1963, who would continue as principal for four years. In a letter published in the 1966 magazine, Miss Briggs addressed the community, praying that St. Hilda's students, past and present, would be known for academic success, but also for social responsibility. She felt that, in quotes, there may be academic distinction, physical prowess, honesty, and grace of manner, but greater than all these is charity. I'll continue because it's actually quite funny. 
1967, Miss Briggs was replaced by Miss Joan Corbett. Miss Corbett introduced herself to the school community through a letter in the school magazine in which she expressed her views on education, stating that the most important lesson to learn of all, and one of the most difficult, is how to live with other people. At the end of the school year, 1969, Miss Corbett would leave. <laughs> Although she had no family of her own, to me, Dora was all about family, and in many ways was the glue that bound our extended family together. Dora was the family historian and the keeper of the family tree. When our family moved to Calgary in 1967, she connected us with the Hartley side of the family, the Fimrites of Western Canada, who became some of our most loved relatives. Jeff and Judy's decision to retire to Bel Air instead of North Auckland was really about living close to Dora and allowed us many happy family Christmases together. But more than that, I knew Dora as someone who treated others like family, and so with kindness and generosity and respect, built a family around her wherever she went. Her friend and carer, Rosalita, describes her as like a second mother to her, a sentiment that I've heard from others. Her friend of 75 years, Flossie from the Gambia, writes, Dora, your generosity and kindness to me and my two sons during my three years of research in London in the 1960s was exemplary. How could I have survived without the moral support of friends like you and Connie? And from Tex Finwright, when we arrived in Buenos Aires some months later, Dora had not returned yet from a lengthy bus tour in Brazil, but she arranged for friends to meet us and entertain us until she returned. We then had a marvelous time with Dora as she showed us all the highlights and best restaurants. She arranged for us to join her great friend Julian and his family on their large estancia, 2,000 head of cattle, 4,000 sheep, 200 ranch horses, 50 gauchos. We had a fantastic week on horseback working the cattle and sheep. You could tell how special Dora was to them by the great way they treated us. And from our youngest generation, Andrew, we spent hours talking about all sorts of things. From three to 23, she always found something we had in common. I think most of us will remember Dora for her kindness, her politeness, and her day-to-day -day generosity, both tangible and in spirit. As most of you know, Dora had a stroke on October 3rd last year, which left her frail and with vascular dementia. She suffered from terrible anxieties and trouble with her short-term memory. She had periods of lucidity and was often able to pull it together for conversations with her closest friends, but we really only saw glimpses of the old Dora after that. Thankfully, her suffering was a memory for the rest of us to bear, because from day to day she never remembered any of it herself. At Royal Adelaide Hospital, they found the right combination of medications to free her from the most troubling emotions, and she spent the last two weeks of her life feeling safe and calm and comfortable at Anglicare Trump Park, enjoying her food and the gardens and being exceptionally well looked after. So much so that her wonderful care Tracy, who was with her almost every day through the final weeks and months, felt able to tease her. As she was leaving that day, she did, had to let Dora know that she'd be away for a short while, taking a long overdue holiday with her husband Ian on a cruise ship around Southern Australia, and that Pam would visit while she was away. Or you can come on board with us if you want. I can break you out of this place and smuggle you on board. <laughs> Dora didn't say anything, but gave her a devilish grin. I know that conspiratorial smile very well. The one that lets you know that she's in on the joke. I wasn't there to see it, but thank you for that reminder, Tracy. That's the way I will always remember Dora. Sadly and mercifully, she had a long journey of her own to make and passed away peacefully in her sleep that night. So goodbye, Joe, from all of us one last time.
birthday present for for her brother and sister in law uh, to do some weaving in the yard. I like my efforts so much, they passed my name on, and uh, from that time on, I was able to uh, work in the garden with Dr. Briggs and hear many stories about the garden, about how it was made, how it was formed, and also the histories that she, that she knew about. Uh, I was blessed to, uh, I was blessed to, uh, my job would be maybe an hour or so, but uh, we could always talk more. Uh, I wouldn't leave maybe for another couple of hours. There's a great story that she often bring up with the, with the relation to her house in Colville in the Mid East of England. Uh, she says this, uh, this table, this stone table that she has at home, was the story that her mother would tell her that's where they hid under when the, when the bombings were happening in, in the UK. Right? And I loved hearing that story. I loved that table. I loved, loved that story of the table. And she had stories forever and ever. And as a, as a young man, I'm always keen to learn about history and, and uh, I just loved sharing my time with her. Uh, uh, Dr. Briggs has also uh, uh, taken me on uh, as a, an aspiring teacher also and really helped me with my studies at Flinders University. She always has a bit of a stern word about certain approaches to uh, the university. <laughs> she gave me encouragement. And I was always encouraged by her, uh, as well as uh, Mr. and Mrs. Briggs also. Uh, I would, after every time I did a job in the garden, uh, Mrs. Briggs would always have a story or a, or a collection of stories that I should be reading or should I take note of. I've got plenty of little notes at home uh, on the side with stories that I should be reading that her sons would read also. Uh, also, that uh, she took on uh, took on my family, my young ones, uh, as a part of her own family. And she loves uh, sharing their stories and, and hearing them, how they read and see them develop. And she always gives me praise for, for how they were growing up in their young minds and, and how I was teaching them to respect their elders. And, uh, Dr. Briggs was an amazing young lady, always young in the eyes of God, and, and uh, a well-versed young lady in this just giving me knowledge, sharing the knowledge with me all the time. You know, every time I walk into the house, there will always be something more to know about, something more to learn, and something more to, to uh, take hold of. And, and I appreciate the, uh, the respect and the, and the inclusiveness of the family, to be part of the family and to uh, be mindful, to share in this occasion as a privilege and an honour to uh, praise Dr. Briggs for the wonderful person that she was to me and to you all. Thank you very much. Dora was a very grateful, gracious lady 
who generously shared her knowledge with joy. How it was always Dora's global travels that brought her enormous pleasure as she relived with us stories of her hometown in Colville, Leicestershire, and the time shared with her family, which meant the most to her. Dora was a feisty lady who always had an opinion on most subjects and delighted in a strong discussion, nothing seeming to please her more than a good, friendly, sprightly chat, whether during parish council or over afternoon tea shared. Dora liked to do things the correct way, whether it was to be simply preparing the buttered toast for the parishioners to share after our early morning Sunday service, where Dora enjoyed the title of apprentice chef in our kitchen, which appealed to her very quirky sense of humour. Dora did like to get things done correctly and move on to the important issues. She was a fiercely independent lady, as we've already heard, who valued very much her own space. The ladies at our local bookshop recently commented on how much they benefited from her wisdom and her very regular supply of recycled books. My husband Alan would often visit Dora on a Monday morning bringing a bunch of homegrown native orchids, which almost always produced a great deal of in-depth discussion. Dora really liked talking about history, heritage, and the issues that concerned us both here and abroad. She was such a learned lady who had so much wealth of knowledge and wisdom. Despite Dora's fierce independence and her careful planning for her in-home care, it eventually became impossible for Dora to join us for service in this beautiful church that she loved. It was then that our team of social workers would visit and share a personal service of Holy Communion and again enjoy a cup together. These visits we know did bring Dora great comfort and strength as she shared God's gifts with the folk who become lifetime friends. We particularly would like to thank our former Krishna Ian McIntosh and his lovely family for supporting Dora as they included her in their family occasions and special events, which she told us many times she appreciated so much. Dora's wealth of knowledge and wisdom was so respected that she, along with fellow Krishna, who's with us today, bowed aside, who also shared the same birth date. And in fact, next Wednesday, both Valda and Dora would have celebrated their 94th birthday, I think. Happy birthday, Dora. Valda. Share it for Dora too. It was an honour to be part of a learning experience when Dora and Valda were invited to impart their knowledge at our ageing seminar, which was conducted last year by our pastoral worker, Anna Swag, and a lovely team of wardens here. Um, her generosity, once again, in sharing all her wisdom was so well received. It has been an absolute delight for us as Dora's parish family to offer just a few words of our memories a very special lady who will be sorely missed but remembered for many years in the parish of her innocence. We feel confident that Dora will be received into God's heavenly kingdom along with many saints who have gone before her from this humble place of worship.
both confronting and beautiful to see a slideshow like that, isn't it? A life contained in that many pictures. But of course, it's not contained in those pictures. It's just a sketch of a much fuller life which uh, Peter you helped describe really beautifully. And PJ, if someone who's not part of my family speaks that beautifully about me when I die, I will be a deeply grateful to you and me for your words for lovely. And Kate, thank you so much uh, for speaking on behalf of the parish. Dora was a person of faith, and uh, it's a less usual thing these days. But it was important to her, and so as part of the funeral, we always have a reading, one of the readings for Psalm 23, which we sung. If you remember the Vicar of Dibley, you know that. <laughs> but um, I'll read to you now from the Gospel of Matthew. And when I thought about which reading I wanted to use for this service, this is the one that immediately came to mind. And after I read it, I'll explain why. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 15, beginning at verse 21. Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then a Canaanite woman came from that region, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David, my daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. And then Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. For the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Dora was born into an age where women were not yet seen as the equals of men in many fields. And this story from the Gospel comes from a time when it was much, much worse. It's an interesting story. Jesus is on his way through a region, and a foreign woman cries out at him. Now, we might think of it, fair enough, but it's just not appropriate in any way, shape, or form to a Jewish man. She's a woman, she should not speak to him. He's a rabbi. She doubly should not speak to him, and she's a foreigner. Triply, she must not speak to him. But this woman has a need. She needs her daughter to be healed. And so she takes upon herself the courage that a mother who loves her child finds when they need to confront authorities who will not listen. And Jesus' disciples ask him to send her away, and Jesus himself says something which can only really be construed as rude. I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And he says, it's not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. We can try as hard as we can, but that's rude. <laughs> but this woman is both intelligent and humble. And she is full of love. And she is seeking something she knows Jesus can provide. And so she says, she takes on the insult. And she says, yes, Lord, even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. And interestingly enough, this is about the only time in the whole of the Gospels where Jesus changes his mind. Because he's confronted by a woman who's actually bettered him. She's taken the insult. She's taken the words and she's turned them. And she said, treat me like that if you will. 
but do what you can. And his answer to her is extraordinary. He doesn't get angry and say, you caught me out, you've embarrassed me in front of my friends. He says to her, woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. We've heard a few words today about Dora. Feisty. Difficult. Opinionated. Stubborn. It's interesting the way, particularly women, women of a certain generation who were intelligent and capable and knew their minds, were often referred to in that way. And the church has been as culpable for this as anyone else, and perhaps even more so. We, when women were allowed to act in positions of authority in so many places, still disallowed women from being priests. That has changed much of the church, but not all. So why was Dora feisty and difficult and stubborn? Well, maybe because she knew what she needed to do in the world. Because she knew she was the equal of the men she saw around her, and she had much to contribute. And from what we've heard of Dora today, she was right, wasn't she? She took people on, and she loved them, and she taught them, and she brought the best out of them. And she went out of her way to go places she did not need to go in order to bring life to people who might not have found it otherwise. In fact, she did exactly what Jesus did. She followed in the steps of the man that she saw as her Lord and the Son of God, who went out of his way, came down from heaven, but also, even as a Jew, went into territories that were not his own and engaged with foreigners, he engaged with the sick, he engaged with women, he engaged with the mentally ill, all things he was not supposed to do, because he knew that if he didn't do it, no one else would do it. He needed to do it, that life might come to those who were lacking. And Dora did the same thing. Yeah. There were times Dora frightened me, I can tell you. Especially on Barry Council. <laughs> and yet, seeing again and again in the pictures, her smile. You know, that's who she was. But she was not stupid and she was dumb. And she needed to be because of the generation that she grew up in. So that she could give to the world what God had given her to do. Stories like this in the Bible shouldn't be there because they were written by people from long ago. Matriarchal societies where women shouldn't have behaved in the way that she did. The reason they're in the Bible is because Jesus was a great iconoclast. There's another story of his encounter with the Samaritan woman at a well it's the longest conversation he has with anyone in the Bible, and it's a theological conversation. He treats her as if she is also a teacher of the law, and yet she's a foreign woman who's been cheeky with him. The church forgot that for nearly 2,000 years. That woman, women have a place in leadership and in teaching. And I'm proud to think that Dora was a member of this congregation. And were I a member of her family or a great friend of hers, I would be proud to have known her. I am pleased that I knew her in a small way that I did because she was an impressive, humble, intelligent, feisty, brave, adventurous and courageous woman. Exactly the sort of woman that God rejoices in and the church needs. And we need men like that too, we're pretty rubbish at <laughs> Women are often so much braver. So, I don't know whether you believe in God. If you do, then fantastic. If you don't, then I hope you will. But Dora did. And I would suggest that what she did in her life, in the way that she treated other human beings, and the way that she lived her life, and the way that she gave and gave and gave, to those who needed her experience and her skill and her support and her encouragement. It's a prime example of what it means to live the gospel out. Not to preach it, but to live it. So as we farewell her today, let us not only remember her as
as a successful human being. But let us remember her as a daughter of the living God, with whom God is well pleased. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. If you wish to, I invite you to stand for the second hymn, Lord of all hope. such a struggle, but she continued to find reasons to smile. We give you thanks for her faith, for her love, her hope, her devotion to the church, and her desire to make it better. Above all, we thank you for your 
gracious promise to all your servants living in the Father, that we shall be made one again in our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Merciful God, we pray for Dora's family and friends, remembering especially Geoffrey, Nick, Peter and Andrew, and all others who were close to her during her life whose sense of loss is so keen. When we cannot understand the things that happen and are weighed down by grief and loneliness, uphold us in your love. Give us the assurance of your constant care that we may have courage for the days ahead. Through Jesus Christ, our friend. Amen. I invite you to join me in praying the Lord's Prayer. As our Saviour Christ has taught us, we are confident to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Lord Jesus Christ, you gave new birth to our sister Dora by water and the Spirit. Grant that her death may recall to us your victory over death, and be an occasion for us to renew our trust in your Father's love. Give us, we pray, the faith to follow where you have led the way, to live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit to the ages of ages. Amen. Let us entrust our sister Dora to the mercy of God. Holy and loving Father, by your mighty power you gave us life, and in your love you have given us new life in Christ Jesus. We entrust Dora to your merciful keeping in the faith of Jesus Christ, who died and rose again to save us, and now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit. In your glory.
predictive. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. You're all welcome to stay and uh, drink coffee and tea and talk together. And there are sausage rolls made of pig, pig, and lama. Thank you all for attending and, uh, and honouring a fabulous life and uh, a really fine human being. So enjoy each other's company and I'll see you out there sometime.